In this video, I'll be discussing the process of CNC machining and how it applied to the parts I was making for my 12 pound hobby weight Draconid. Later on, I hope to talk more about the process of operating a CNC machine like the Tormach PCNC 1100 shown here. I know that most people might not have access to a Tormach as it is a $15,000 to $25,000 machine, but the same principles apply to any hobby or professional CNC. In fact, many makerspaces exist that have equipment such as the Tormach, Haas, or other CNC mill, and even more universities have such equipment, but I digress. In terms of those you'll likely find at a local makerspace, or even entertain purchasing yourself, the $400 3040 China Special, or even a $1200 to $2000 Shepoko is extremely popular among makers and makerspaces alike. The main difference is that you don't get nearly the torque or overall power from a router designed to cut wood that you do on a mill designed to cut metal, and you lose out on the built-in cooling systems that frequent CNC mills, although adding your own mist cooling setup is pretty easy and cheap. You'll also probably lose the ability to have a computerized spindle RPM control, but that's easily compensated for with a $20 tachometer. In fact, the ShopBot Buddy CNC router my makerspace also has can handle aluminum only about as well as the Shepoko, despite having many more times the cut volume and a 3.3 kilowatt spindle, simply because of the lack of cooling. You can do it, it's just much slower than a mill. The builder of Diceratops, a 30 pound sportsman bot I fought against at Motorama last year, told me he made every part of his machine at home on a Shepoko, and it's an impressive piece of engineering. I just spent several hours combing through footage, which I took over about 30 total hours spent in the makerspace over three days of the holiday break, machining parts for my hobby weight robot Draconid. I'm going to make three separate videos from that, each one from one day of footage, so I can show the start to finish machining of several parts per video. Even with that in mind, I had over three hours of footage from day one, so all of this is greatly sped up, at least ten times or so. I don't want to get too far into the reads in this video, as I would like for it to be useful for those who can afford to outsource their machining, as well as those, like me, seeking to do it themselves. But there are also many, many great resources I'll link down below for those interested in really digging deep. I'll also keep in mind that CNC machining, like anything DIY, takes practice. I wish I could say being a mechanical engineering student taught me all about this, but that wasn't the case at all. There was only one time I was required to use one in school, and that was after years that I had spent learning to do it myself, watching videos like this one on YouTube. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say from what I see on the Combat Robotics Facebook page, most robot builders who take Combat Robotics seriously, particularly those who build insect bots, will own a selection of hand tools, maybe smaller power tools, and possibly even a 3D printer because they're relatively cheap today. But when it comes to metal, most will outsource pretty much all of it to water jetting, laser cutting, and for mainly larger bots, CNC machining services online. CNC machining is done by tons of companies like Sometry, Big Blue Saw, 3D Hubs, Proto Labs, and more. Unlike the first two, however, CNC machining is actually really expensive. That's because of the complicated nature of the process and how labor intensive it is. You could easily expect to be paying over $100 for a part, especially if you're only ordering one. Water jet, laser, plasma, all of these are 2D processes. They cut straight through material and that's it. This means all of the work is done in one setup. They also have exactly the same consumables for every job. It's pretty much just lay down or clamp down a sheet and go. The human component is really minor and you don't need to be a highly skilled technician with years of experience. CNC, on the other hand, is a whole other ballgame. Parts can be made with many setups on common 3-axis machines, and more complex parts might be made on a 4- or 5-axis machine with quickly ballooning costs for machine time and labor. In fact, there are freaking 12-axis CNC lathes out there with live tooling coming from multiple directions, so that's well outside of what a combat robot will generally need. If you can design your parts for 3-axis machining, it will greatly reduce the cost of outsourcing, maybe even make it a DIY project. However, you need to keep in mind how the part will be held to get access to the features you need to machine, and even what order they'll be machined in. This brings us to work holding, one of the other gigantic rabbit holes that exists besides feeds and speeds in the machining world. If your part is a box and has flat opposing faces, a vise is probably going to be your best bet. I designed all the parts for my 12 pound bot to be held in a vise, but sometimes you need to access all of the outside edges of a part which makes it difficult. One common option used on large table routers like the Shepoko or ShopBot is using stock much bigger than the part and using tabs to keep the part in place so it won't fly away when released from the stock after basically cutting a contour that follows the outside edge of the part. This is great for making crazy 2D shapes with different size holes and other cutouts, but then it would really be better to use a 2D process like 
laser cutting, or water jetting. If you need to then add holes or other features on one of the edges of the part, especially on a curved or angled surface, you've just made a machinist's life incredibly difficult. Work holding is a problem not only for holding, but for precisely locating the part and its features. You need a way to either keep the part in a location and orientation where the machine can place all the features you need, or have a way to probe the part or another area of your setup to find exactly where to go. The Shapoko machines have an XYZ block add-on for this, but the Tormach doesn't. There is a 3D passive probe which is on the way, and I'll be using that in the future, but that thing costs $400. That's half the cost of this entire robot. Thankfully, I convinced another Makerspace member to order it in exchange for my help learning to use this machine. Hopefully, he never watches this video to discover that I actually have no clue what I'm doing. You can also use an edge finder or dial gauges for this purpose, but that's incredibly tedious and slow, although it will almost certainly prove more accurate than what I'm doing here. Instead, I relied on manual machinist practices of using the edges of tools to locate the corner of my milling vise, and then based everything off that and my known stock dimensions. This was critical for me to always know the X and Y measurements for a corner of every part in every orientation, as I could use those plus the stock top as the datum for each operation. A datum is basically the origin that every movement of the machine is based off of. If you know exactly where the origin is, you can do anything at precise locations as needed. This extends beyond CNC to really all manual machining as well. In order to always get a part to the same datum point, I first clamped a 1-2-3 block to the side of the vise, which is just a metal block where one side's 1 inch, one side's 2 inches, one side is 3 inches exactly. That way I could butt the parts up against the same edge repeatedly every time, and always be locating against that left side edge, and thus that same corner of the vise. I had some issues with this on the larger parts later, but I'll discuss that in my next two machining videos. By at least starting each of my parts with a rectangular block of some size, I was able to exclusively purchase bar stock, which was a lot cheaper and easier to work with than sheets of material that would be a foot or more across. Not only did this save me a huge amount of time measuring and cutting stock myself, but it gave me both the bar width and thickness as known dimensions, which I could count on. I ordered all of my stock from Xometry Supply, which meant everything was saw cut, and I made sure to get it all cut within an eighth inch of the final size that I needed, so I'd be able to do every operation for a given size of one part, and then swap in the next piece of stock, rinse, and repeat. This greatly reduced the setup time, which is one of the major time sinks in CNC machining, driving up the labor costs associated with it. If I were to do each multiple setup part one at a time, I'd need to zero the Z every time I changed orientations for the next setup. In this case, I only had a single part which was one setup. You'll notice for these sides for the weapon mount, I faced off all five at once. This is because they were purchased as 3 inch by 1.75 inch bar, and the 1.75 inch dimension was saw cut, so everyone was oversized a little bit in that dimension. As is often the case in machining, it's better to be consistent than accurate. So I zeroed my tool at the base of the vise, set it to face down to 1.75 inches in the Z axis, and then got them all to the exact same final height. Thankfully, Zometry's saw cuts are incredibly perpendicular to the stock edges, so that's not something you should count on generally. You can see here the last part I made this day was the weapon mount block. For this I had a 3 by 3 half inch bar cut at the 3 half dimension, so my last operation was to run the cutter along the far edge, and I had to leave that sticking out of the vise. For that part I also needed to come in from all four sides, but I only needed to pocket out about a quarter inch of the half inch piece, depth-wise, so I used taller parallels to keep more than a quarter inch sticking out above the vise. This meant the tool could easily access where needed without killing itself or the vise. I know this probably sounds absurdly complicated and time-consuming, and to an extent it is, but so is designing and building combat robots. The thing that draws me and probably a lot of you to love the sport of combat robotics is learning and practicing these engineering principles in a fun and exciting way. I personally have come to take joy in making parts come to life from a 3D model in CAD, and it's much more satisfying than 3D printing when you're also putting so much real hard work into it with the machining process. I know a lot of machinists feel the same way about manual machining, and I prefer that the CNC aspect doesn't take away from my enjoyment of the process. It simply saves the far, far more time-consuming and tedious work it would take to produce the same or similar parts with manual means, and it makes them much more consistently and accurately than I could otherwise manage. It also obviously unlocks possibilities that would be impractical or impossible for manual machines. For instance, the 3D contours you can see in my video on making parts for Bloodsport using a ball and mill. While 3D printing has its place in plastics, right now CNC machining is king with metals. 
It's the predominant manufacturing method for making engineering grade parts in any kind of metal. As a professional mechanical engineer myself, pretty much every part I design at work is meant to be CNC machined on some combination of computer controlled lathes and mills. And while at work I don't get to do any of that myself, I love that it's accessible to me at this makerspace. I would encourage any of you who think they may want to learn more to look online and see if there's a makerspace in your area with one of these machines, or if you're a student, check if your university has a machine shop where you can enroll in a class or freely access the equipment. At the University of Rochester, where I went to school, Retner had all of that equipment. For my older brother at Case Western Reserve University, they have a facility called the ThinkBox, which is 50,000 square feet specifically dedicated to allowing people to work on machines like this. I plan on expanding more on this in my next couple videos, but consider this more of an overview than a tutorial. Maybe someday I can do something more tutorial-like, but there are already a lot of people more skilled than me making videos like that, so maybe give them a look first. For Tormach machines, that would be NYC CNC. For Shapoko types, check out the Carbide 3D channel and Winston Moy's personal channel, as he makes all of their videos and many more on his own. All of these go into detail on how to turn 3D CAD models into machine toolpaths using Fusion 360 and other free software programs. That's all for this time. Look forward to more of this in my next video with some more complicated parts. If you want a sneak peek at the parts to come, follow me on Instagram at JustCauseRobotics. That's J-U-S-T-C-U-Z Robotics. Happy New Year, everyone, and happy bot building.